Amen. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We give you honor and glory, Lord. Your will be done in this place, Lord. You speak to the hearts of the people, Lord. Lord, we know, Lord, that every good thing comes from you, Father. So, Lord, we ask for grace and mercy, not that we expect it or deserve it, Lord, but, Lord, but that it is something that you freely choose to give to a people, to a people who call upon you through your only name, Jesus. So, Lord, praise your holy name. Lord, move in our hearts and our minds right here, right now. Holy Spirit, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you glorify the Father. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would penetrate the mind and the heart. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would baptize those here and those watching in your Holy Spirit. Your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. In John chapter 4, we're going to be in John chapter 4 this morning. We're going to be in part 2 of Encounters with Jesus. Now, we can go on and on. And the Bible says that there are many... There are so many books that were written about the Lord that, that if, if they were all written, um, the world would not have room enough to contain them. And so that's what the Bible says in the book of John, at the end of the book of John, about, about just the works of Jesus Christ, um, God in the flesh. So we can not even begin to capture the encounters with Jesus in the Bible alone, you know, in just a couple of weeks. But I, there's just some, some stories that the Lord is really drawing out to my attention to really speak to you about this morning. And um, I truly believe that the way we are right now in this world, that we are drawing so, so closer to, to the coming of Christ for his church. I believe that with all my heart. And I hope you can believe that with all your heart. And I pray that those watching live uh, on the Internet that you know that Jesus is, is coming. And we see it, but more importantly, we believe it. Not that you feel it. We cannot worship God by our, by our feelings and emotions. Because if we worship God by our feelings and emotions, our, we're going to be up and down all the time. But God calls us to be consistent in our joy, consistent in our faith, consistent in our walk. And so therefore, we cannot worship Jesus Christ. We cannot base our Christian life on our emotions, on our feelings, on what we're going by. You may have a bad day, but hey, God's still on his throne. Amen? And so what does the word of God say? You know, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so when God finds us with a sincere heart, a, a, a sincere mind, where we're committed to the purpose of God being done in our life, then those are the people that God seeks after. And uh, it's funny because uh, I, I think it, oh, I, I don't want to pick on Gabriel. Were you playing wolf at the church retreat? Uh, Brother Bill was with us, and uh, <laughs> we were hiking, and uh, we heard somebody up in the mountain going, hell, hell. And, you know, with Bill being in the Marine Corps, Bill goes, man, that's not funny. You, can, you shouldn't play around like that. And Joel was at the camp, and Joel even came on up. To, to see what was going on. He came in his flip-flops and everything. No, I'm just kidding. But Joel came on up there because he had heard it. So he came on up, and Joel, when he came up to me, he's like, you know, he was concerned. Somebody's saying help. You know, somebody said help. And I'm like, no, nah, that's Gabriel messing around. But you see, Gabriel's a, a city folk. You know what I'm saying? He's from Northside Houston. You know, he's used to hearing people say help all the time. <laughs> Amen. So... That's why Gabriel could do that. But out in the country, when you got mountain lions and bears, you don't say help unless you really mean it. And so the reason why I say that is because a lot of times we cry help, help, help. And we don't necessarily mean it. And God knows when we're crying wolf, playing around. But when you're sincere and you mean it and you're really crying for help, God's going to show up. It's not that God don't care or God don't love you, or God plays games with you. It's just that, look, I've come to notice something about the Lord. He is a gentleman, and his time is very valuable. Yes, he is not contained by time. He is forever, always has been, and always will be. But, and so our human minds can understand his time is precious. And so he tends to the sheep. And he tends to all the sheep, even those that are not even in his fold yet. 
he tends to all, but he knows who's playing. He knows who's sincere. So when you come to him with a sincere heart, he's going to work in your life. There was a woman who was a Samaritan, and she had been through several marriages. She was probably living a promiscuous life, a sexual moral life. And, uh, but she, I do tell you this, that she had a heart that was seeking after God. I believe that's just my opinion because the Lord will always show up to you whether you really believe it or not, whether you know it, whether you even know you're seeking God or not, God knows you better than you know yourself. And so God knows when to show up. Amen. And in John chapter 4, Jesus knew when to show up. In John chapter 4, it says here in verse 7, it says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water at a well. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman. For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. There was a racial division back then, even as we have always had throughout the world. But the Jews and the Samaritans, they did not get along. They hated each other. Everything about each other they did not like. And so here's Jesus, a Jew, God in the flesh, but a Jew. He's going through the town of Samaria, and through the, 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 the land, I'm sorry. And he comes to a water well. And this shows Jesus in his humanity. He's thirsty. He's hungry. He's tired. He has experienced, God has experienced what we experience. And so we need to see how we can know that we have a God. We serve and worship a God who knows your weaknesses. Who knows your failures. Because he stepped into man and he walked the earth. And so he was thirsty. He approached racism as well. He approached these things. He dealt with these things, just as you do too. And so in verse 10 it says, Jesus answered her and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus says, I'm asking you for a drink of water. But if you really know who it is you're talking to, you would be asking me for, for things of eternity. To have life, not as you've always known to have it, but an even better life. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus comes that you may have life and have life abundantly. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you have a good paying career and good health and good job and money in the bank. That's not what this is talking about. God will meet your need. See, because a lot of times we can have money and wealth and that will just corrupt us to the core and will totally isolate us from God. Who's ever had money and went and lived like the devil? Amen? Yeah. Amen. Some guys raising their hands up way out there. Make sure you got deodorant on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, uh, but money can do that to some people. Not everybody, Amen. but to many, money can do that too. And so God knows what we need. God knows what we can become good stewards of. And so in regards here, the only thing this woman was a good steward of was getting water at a well for her family. Everyday life, that was for her. It's not like today where we can go to the, you know, in America, we can go and turn on a faucet and bam, the water comes out. No, no, no. They had to work to enjoy the daily things that we enjoy every day. They had to go and sweat to get what we can just turn with our wrist on. And see, we can't really think that far, go back that way, because we've never known life like that. But, but still, the struggles, the things that we go through today, they went through as well. And so Jesus says to her, if you knew who I really am, you know, if we really know who Jesus is, if we really know who Jesus is, if we really trust in what Jesus is saying to us, we're standing at a water well. You know, every day we're at that water well. What, what does the water well symbolize in our life today? Our basic needs to have everyday life. We, 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 we're there. We're at that water well every day. 
And Jesus is at that water well because Jesus wants to know that it doesn't necessarily come, your, your sustaining of everyday life doesn't come from your job. It doesn't come from your family, your husband, your, your wife, and whatever it may be. It comes from Jesus Christ alone. That's where it comes from. And so therefore, that's where Jesus met her. And Jesus will meet you, all of us. He'll meet us where he needs to meet us, where we can understand, where we can start from square one with him. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw. I mean, you don't have a bucket. You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You know, she, Jesus is speaking on spiritual terms to her, and she is still stuck in the physical realm. Is that you today? Is that me? Is that us today? Where Jesus is trying to speak to you, Christian, about spiritually heavenly things, and we are still stuck on the physical. We find that in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus. You know that one of the greatest scriptures in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Jesus was telling that to Nicodemus. And Jesus was explaining eternal life to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, just the previous chapter over. But Jesus goes on to tell Nicodemus, how is it that you're a teacher of Israel and you can't even understand these heavenly things I'm talking to you about? You see, Jesus is trying to get us to tap into the supernatural realm of God. Jesus desires that we go deeper in our walk with God and not trust in the things of the world and the things of man in our own reasoning and our own understanding. I mean, there's so many levels of this, guys. Are, are, you, are, you, you, are you an entrepreneur? Are you trying to have a business where, where you want to have a prosperous business, but yet God is saying, you know, yeah, you can have that, but I want to take you deep in faith with Jesus Christ. Are you sick in bed? And are you having cancer, uh, any kind of form of sickness in a hospital bed? Are you facing death? And are we stuck on the physical condition when God is saying, what about the spiritual condition? See, the Lord wants to take us into the spiritual realm. If our eyes were all closed to the physical realm right now and, our, and we were open to the spiritual realm, you would see in this church angels. You would, you would to a degree, you would, you would see Jesus. You, you would go out into the world, you see demonic forces out there. But all the spiritual realm is closed to our physical eyes. And so we only see what these eyes can see. We hear what these ears can hear. We, we touch, so we believe. We smell, so we believe. And we feel, so we believe. And Jesus says, my people shall live by faith. And so this woman was about to get a faith check. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And you say, water here, you're going to give me living water? She says, you are not greater than our father Jacob. You see, Jacob served the Lord. But yet this woman is telling Jesus, you're not greater than our father Jacob. You see, a lot of people tend to fall on family tradition as well. And let family tradition get in the way of their walk with Jesus Christ. Because that's what it was doing right here. She goes, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? You gave us, who gave us this well? Jacob did, dug this well. Jacob and his men, they dug deep. This, they got some good water. They dug this well. You're not greater than Jacob, she says who gave us the well, and drank of it himself. Even Jacob stood here hundreds of years before and drank from this very well, and his sons and his cattle. Are you going to say, sir, that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? See, that's kind of like people today in society. We tend to believe in what scientists say. We tend to believe in what our ancestors, our forefathers have said about that go against the, the deity and the power of God Almighty. Why is it that some people worship God this religion or that religion? Because their grandparents did and their grandparents did. And so that came a time for me in my life where I said, you know, I don't want to worship God because my parents did this or my grandparents did that. I said, I truly want to have a, a close encounter with Jesus. And that's what this message is about, encounters with Jesus. Uh, Lord, I want to know you for who you are, Lord. There's got to be a passion and a desire to really get down. You know, as Christians, we've seen a lot of hypocrites in the church, amen? But that's no excuse from you touching Jesus. We've seen a lot, of, a lot of abuse in the pulpit, amen? But that's no excuse from you having an encounter with Jesus today. And so Jesus answered her in 13, verse 13. He says, 
He said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Amen? Now look, I got some natural spring water here. And I drank about five of these last night before I went to bed and went to bed still thirsty. Probably because of that chocolate cake I ate. Amen? <laughs> and Jesus said, you are going to drink here, but you're going to get thirsty again. Verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now, church, Jesus was not talking about a future tense. He was talking about something that we can experience even right now on the earth. Why is it, Christian, that you see other Christians always having joy, jumping, skipping, singing? And you're like, well, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? How come I can't get there? How come I can't raise my hands up in the assembly? How come I, I want to dance, but I'm afraid people will look at me and laugh? I want to go up for altar call and have someone pray over me or me just pray with somebody, but I'm afraid what people are going to say. I'm afraid to speak about Jesus in the public forum because, you know, of backlash. Why can't I do that when I see other strong Christians? They're just bold out there. You know, there's that water well from within. The Lord is saying, when you confessed, when you believed, what you did was you were letting go. When you, you see, here's the thing that we need to understand about salvation. Watch this. Please watch this. When you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose from the dead, the Bible says you're saved. And you accept him as your Lord and Savior. But see, here's the thing. When you believe in your heart and you confess, what, what has just happened? To a degree, you have just released pride. You have just been humbled because your heart's been moved. And you are releasing anger. You're releasing hate. You're saying, I trust in you, God. And you're saying, Jesus, come into me. You're letting the old man die and come out of you so that the Spirit of God can come in you. And so now, as a new Christian, the Spirit is in you, and he begins to well up water of life in you, move in you. And therefore, as a new Christian, and even as an old Christian, what I mean by old Christians, you've been serving God 30, 40 years. Because we can serve God 30, 40 years and go all the way back to being an infant in Christ. Thinking like a baby, acting like a baby in Christ, where we make foolish decisions all over again. And so when we have the Holy Spirit begin to bubble up in us, we begin to have a passion and a desire to really seek what God has for us. And we're no longer focused on drinking this water, but drinking the Holy Spirit. And we be able, we're able now, because we drink the Holy Spirit, we're able to do supernatural things. Why is it that Peter and Paul and even Jesus and many of the prophets in the Bible, why is it that they could fast 40 nights, 40 days, they had no food, no water. Why? Because the Spirit of God was doing an incredible work in them. And they were doing things to defy what mankind says cannot be done. And so that's why Jesus was telling this woman at the water well, you're going to get thirsty when you drink this water again. You're going to get thirsty again and again and again. But Jesus said, I want to do something new in your life and in everyone who confesses in my name. It's going to come to a point in time where you've been, you've been focused on the Lord and you, know, you begin to neglect the needs of the body, the needs of the flesh. And the needs of the flesh can lead you so far away from the plan of God. You know, sexual temptation is one of the big is the biggest lust of the flesh. And I'm just going to tell you, you know, that, that is something that sexual temptation is something we must avoid at all at all at all things we must avoid that. Because that is what really corrupts the entire being of a human being. It destroys our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Satan knows this. And I'm saying this for a reason, because of what we're about to read. Verse 15 says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. See, she's still stuck in the physical realm. You know, God is patient and will work with us. You know, you're, you know he was trying to tell, he was trying slowly, Jesus was trying to get 
to what was wrong in her. That's what Jesus, he was slowly going in that direction of what was wrong with her. And that's the way Jesus works in our lives. He'll slowly, sometimes he'll just go right to it because some people can handle that. And some people just, they need a moment, you know. But the Lord will work to what is wrong in you. And he wants to remove that if you could surrender it. He'll remove it and put that water that wells up to eternal life in you. And as that Christian that allows that process to happen, you begin to live in this world and you see things the way God sees things. You hear things the way God hears things. You react to things the way God reacts to things. And that is the mark of a real born-again believer of Jesus Christ. That's who God's looking for. The moving of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. Jesus was prophesying this. It was going to come. He goes, I will give you the water of life. Jesus said, I'll give it to you. And it came. When Jesus died and rose from the dead and he told his disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait until the gift. And that full gift of the Holy Spirit came. But even before he went to the cross, he breathed on them. In the book of John, he goes, receive the Holy Spirit. And though, even though Peter, to a certain degree, had received the availability to attain the Holy Spirit, he still denied Jesus Christ. So there are some Christians, yes, there are Christians. Every Christian has the, the Holy Spirit in them. Because it's only the Holy Spirit that can reveal the cross of Jesus to you. It's only the Holy Spirit. But there's another, there's another level of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And being baptized in the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm not talking about a Pentecostal, an assembly of God, or a, a Baptist, or a, or a Presbyterian thing. I'm talking about a biblical move of God in your life. That's what we're talking about here. And that's what Jesus was trying to talk to this woman about. Because not only am I about to bring salvation to you, eternal life, but I'm going to bring power into your life. For where you don't have to depend on the physical needs anymore, but the spiritual water that comes from God, the spiritual power that comes from God. Verse 16, he said to her, go, call your husband and come here. She was hungry. You know, Jesus, in a way, he was a salesman. He gave her that heavenly pitch, and she took it. And he says, well, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have, the one who's kicking it, watching TV in your hut, you know, while you're going to get in the water. That's how most men are, I think, right? Amen? No. <laughs> Anyways, the one you now have, whom you now have, is not your husband. This you have said truly. This woman had been living in lusting of the flesh. Yes, she had five husbands. But this one now, we don't know what happened to that fifth husband. We don't know what happened to the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. But maybe they all died one right after the other. Maybe she was a difficult woman and drove them to the grave. I don't know. But this fifth husband, we don't know what happened. But now she's living with a man. She's living with a man. And this is not just directed towards women. This is men as well. She's... She, she, She's been searching for something, searching for something, and she can't find it. She tries to look for it in man when it's only in Jesus. When are we going to learn our lesson, church? When what we really need is not found in the world, it's not found in relationships, it's not found in men or women, it's found in Christ alone. And when you seek that and attain that, you're going to stop living in a merry-go-round, in a whirlwind, going back and forth, back and forth. You're going to know where you're going and know what you're doing. The woman said to him, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> That's funny. You know, Jesus tells her her business. He tells her what flavor her Kool-Aid is. And she goes, Sir, I, I perceive you're a prophet. Right? See, that's what's missing in the church today. Prophetic words coming to you. A word of knowledge. Of, you know, that that's what's missing, the moving of the Holy Spirit in that way. Where, where this, this one says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Oh, my goodness, you have just told me everything. She goes, now she tries to get religious, okay? 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. See, up until this point, she couldn't understand the spiritual things that Jesus was talking about. But now that she understands that, oh, this is not just some guy who's thirsty and wants some water. This is a prophet. So all of a sudden, she changes her gears, and she becomes religious. As a pastor, I've spoken to so many people like that. Before they knew I was a pastor, they were cussing and doing this. And I don't care. I'm a man. I'm not God. But it's just so funny how people react when they find out, oh, you're a pastor. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wait a minute, buddy. Just did it. Weren't you just... <laughs> I mean, I'm nobody, but you're living your life before God. It's, you know, I mean, come on. People don't realize that we live our life every day before the Lord. Even though no man can see what you're doing, God sees. He sees your conduct. He hears your vocabulary. He sees the desires of your heart. He sees the motives of your mind and heart. He sees these things. He perceives these things. He knows these things. And she thinks, oh, now she can change gears, not realizing that she's talking to God in the flesh. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. See, she was saying, well, you Jews say you got to worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans believe that we worship God at this mountain here. You know, God is wherever you are. You don't have to go to Jerusalem to the temple today. Well, it's, you know, the Wailing Wall, whatever you want to call it. You don't have to come into this church, even though there's nothing wrong with those things. But God is where you are. As a matter of fact, if you call yourself a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you. Amen. You are the body. You are the temple of the living God. Amen. He says, you worship what you do not know. He tells the woman that. He says, but we, the Jews, he says, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews because Jesus was the Jew. He says, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers here. Look, here is the time now, not just then when he spoke this to her, but right now. And this is the whole point of this message right here. He says, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. See, there are many type of people who claim to worship God. There are many worshipers in this world. There are many faiths in this world. There are many religions in this world. But Jesus, either he was a liar, lunatic, or he told the truth. Jesus, in his own words, said, there are many type of worshipers, but there's only one that the Father seeks after. The Father seeks one type of person in this world. Are you that person? Are you that person? Some of you can say, well, I, don't even know, I really don't even know who that person is that God seeks after. Well, let's, let, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Go with me to uh, John chapter 14, verse 6. Keep your finger on John 4. In John chapter 14, verse 6, and the scripture's behind me, by the way. I'm going to read this. It says, Then Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So what does it mean back in John 4? Verse 22 and 23, where, where 23 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Must, not should, not, you know, sometimes we must always worship God in spirit and in truth. Because that's the only worshiper that God accepts, seeks after, delivers, loves, has fellowship with. Those who worship in spirit and in truth. Now, what does it mean to be a worshiper of spirit and truth to God. What does that mean? Who is that? John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We're going to confess the Father in heaven, the maker of heaven and earth. He says through his Son that it's only through Jesus. God in the flesh. Now, there's so much to learn about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but they're one. Three persons, but yet one. 
You know, you look at yourself. You're made in mind, body, and soul. The book of Genesis says you were created in the image of God. But yet you're one. But you have three parts to you. Amen? When, you're, when your soul leaves, the body drops to the floor. It's still there. The most precious commodity on the face of the earth is what? Water. It symbolizes what? Life. And it has three parts. Mass form, which is ice. Then it evaporates into thin air, and then it comes down again in the form of liquid and water. And so many times, Jesus referred to water as life. And water has three parts as well, yet it's, yet it's one. And the same it is with human mankind. And the same it is with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, he who has me has the Father. That's what Christ said. And so if we really want to know who the Father is, we hold to the teachings of Jesus Christ as the very Word of God. We can only come to heaven through Jesus Christ. Now, go with me to Romans chapter 12. And you can see behind me the scripture. Verse 1 says this, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, Paul writes, therefore I urge you, brethren. See, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to brethren. He says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, by, by, by the mercy that God has for you. He says, to present your body, slap yourself. Okay, some of you didn't want to do it. No, That's your body. But not just your body, your mind your heart, your soul, your whole being. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which, here you go, is your spiritual service of worship. How is it? You know how to worship God in truth. That is through Jesus Christ. But how do you worship God in spirit? Through surrendering your body to Christ. And you know what that means? Walking away from sin. Not living a habitual lifestyle of sin. Though you will mess up at times, you learn from your mistakes. You go forward and you don't make those mistakes again. Because a Christian is ever growing in their knowledge and faith of what is right and what is wrong. So therefore, verse 2 says this, and do not be conformed to this world, meaning don't look like the world. What does the world look like today? Look at America. Look at the, the, the temptations and the lusts and the desires. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't look like the world, says the word, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Make up your mind what you're going to do. Everyone can go to hell in a handbasket, but I'm not going. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, watch this, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. A true worshiper of Jesus Christ is called to prove in this world what the will of God is by the way they live their life. Now, we cannot do that by condemning others and judging others outside of the church. The Bible says that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. When we as Christians come together, God has given us a right to be accountable to one another. To say, hey, brother, what's wrong with you? Why are you living like this? Come on, let's get right. That's what a family does, amen? But we as a church of Jesus Christ around the world, we cannot point our fingers at the murderers and the thieves and the, the sexually immoral. We, we, we cannot do that. Those who don't know Christ... We love them to the cross of Jesus. And, and God will work in them and save them. But those who are in the church, to whom much has been given, much is required. We have been given salvation. We didn't earn it. We were given it. And we have to not attain it, but we have to honor it. And a true worshiper of God will honor what Jesus did on the cross. A true worshiper of God will honor what Jesus did on the cross by the way they live their life. And if you don't honor God in the way you live your life, it shows that you were deceived by Satan and you never knew the plan of God at all. 
and you'll wake up one day in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's so much scripture that can back up what has just been said. And that's why Jesus went to this woman at the water well and he said to her, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's through Jesus Christ alone. And when you surrender all to Jesus, you will have all of God in your life. Because you've given all. God has already given all. But now because you give all, you're going to really see the favor of God in your life. And when you close your eyes and you step out of this world, and it will happen one day, you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's already in the heart of the Christian today, the kingdom of heaven. The presence of God, the joy of the Lord, the mercies of God arise fresh every morning. You know, There's a lady that came to this church in a, wheel, uh, in, in, a, in a chair. Her knees are shot. She has no knees. Cartilage. Just bone against bone. And she was crying. Such in pain that, that she couldn't barely make it to church today. But she knows where God has called her to be. And who am I or who is anyone to want to take that away from her? Her sacrifice, her effort, when so many, so many choose to just hit and miss. And I see Brother Abel here, who's sitting here and he struggles to walk. He struggles. A lot of times you're alone, but you're really not alone. He needs the, the crutches to walk with. But he, and, and if you hug him when he sits down, he is just almost drenched in sweat because it takes every ounce of strength for him to just get from the, the car that he was dropped off in to right here to another 100 feet to where he sits. So there's not much, you know, the burden that Christ has put on us, it's not great. Yes, it's a it costs us something, but it's what... what we, we, we are blessed. What, Lord, I mean, we walk and we can talk and we can breathe and we have, we have resources and favor that God has given to us. And we're living in an age now where we see such evil moving in the world, in society. And we have the golden opportunity to be able to be used for the purposes of God in America and to be influencers around the world. And are we going to understand the reality of our times and do something or are we just going to miss it and sleep right through church service and then wake up one day and you're in hell I mean I'm not judging here but Jesus said that there will be many that will find the road to hell it will be wide and Jesus said that there will be a, a road to heaven that it will be narrow and only a few will find it. This is not a fire and brimstone message, but this is a message that Jesus spoke of. And we, we see so many distractions and temptations in this world that pull us this way and pull us that way from really being focused on the plan of God. Not just for our lives, but for the plan of God for this world. And this woman was at the water well. Verse 27 says, at this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot, went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging the, the rabbi to eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Verse 35, do you not say, says Jesus, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored 
Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Jesus said, I just spoke to this woman at the water well. Others sowed seed into her life and I'm coming to reap the harvest. And it's going to be like that, guys. You're going to start sowing seed and others are going to come years later and reap the harvest. Souls for Jesus. Amen. Verse 39 says, from that city... Many of the Samaritans believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things that I'd done, she said. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two more days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of you that you said what you said that we believe, for now we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. When this woman got called out, when this woman received the power of God, the knowledge of God, the, I mean, all the goodness of God, she became an evangelist. She went back to where she came from, from her life of sin. She went back and she proclaim the mercy of God, the salvation of God. And guess what? They started hearing. They started getting hungry too and thirsty too. And they came with her to hear this great prophet. And they began to tell her, we believe he's the Christ. No longer because of what you said, but we believe for ourselves because we have had our own encounter with Jesus Christ. See, now you can lead somebody through the power of the Holy Spirit to the cross of Jesus, but they got to have their own encounter with Jesus. Now, if you're just standing from a distance, spiritually speaking, and you see Jesus from the distance with that cross, and it's, your life is still the same, you're still struggling with sin, you're still being you know, desensitized by the sins of the world, and you know about the Bible, but you, just, you see Jesus from a distance, you see that cross from a distance, but there's just no power in your life, Get to the foot of the cross. Have that encounter with Jesus. Go up and say, Lord, forgive me. One thing that Connor had told that I heard through Mildred is that Connor said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. He had an encounter. 11-year-old boy had an encounter with Jesus. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Oh, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. That's what he told Jesus. We need to, when you have that encounter with Jesus, you begin to understand who you really were apart from Christ. That you were a sinner. That you, you were on your way to hell. But God stepped in and did something about it. And to Him be the glory. And so, because He saved us, and He continues to save us, what can we do for the Savior today? Not that we're trying to pay Him back, but we can start by just living a life that is honoring to him. Many of us have a desire to go and do things, be missionaries, and I'm speaking to those watching on the internet to do, to do such great things, the enter into ministry, but it's got to begin with Jesus and you at the water well. Amen. Your own personal life. Amen. A lot of people, they, they see Jesus and, oh, I want to get involved in ministry, and oh, I want to do this, and oh, I want to do that. When they hadn't had that encounter with Christ. And you can never forget that encounter with Christ. I remember it as it was yesterday, today, this morning. When Jesus spoke to me on June 8, 2003. Liquor on my breath. I remember that. I spoke to a couple of men in the church and we were talking about how we could never go back to that life. Never, never, never. How could we ever go back to that life? How? How? My God, we could have died. We could have died and went to hell. We were deserving of it. Still are deserving of it. But because of his mercy, because of what Jesus offers, Buddha can't offer that. Allah can't offer that. They don't even exist. They're just words on a page. But this word, Jesus, he's the living word of God. And he wants to reveal himself to this world through you, church. The greatest time the church ever ever flourished was in times of persecution. And if you will just open the blinds and look outside America, you're going to see that your brothers and sisters in Christ, while we're sitting in the AC watching our favorite movie, eating on popcorn, our brothers and sisters in Christ 
are dying. By the day, thousands every day for their faith in Jesus because they will not deny this Bible that some of you can't even carry anymore, didn't even bring to church. It's not even, you know, it's one thing to carry, but it's got to be in our heart. It's got to be in our mind. It's got to be something that we're passionately in love with. They're dying. And then sometimes we get our feathers ruffled when the boss yelled at us. Or we didn't get, we, we got skimped on our check, paycheck. We got shorted three, four hours and we're upset. Or uh, we've got a little sickness going on. Or we've got a little family rebellion going on with the kids. I mean, that's kindergarten stuff compared to what the rest of the church around the world is experiencing. When hearts are being cut out and heads are being chopped off and, and flesh is being boiled alive still to this day, starved to death. And we're going to enter into the kingdom of God saying, I did all I could do, Jesus. The church of Jesus Christ in America is in for a reality check. I love this nation with all my heart. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else besides the United States of America. But we have allowed the enemy physically, spiritually, to come into this nation, to come into our church, the church of Jesus Christ. But God is faithful. He will not let the gates of hell prevail against this church. I'm not saying to go out and protest and to picket. No, I'm saying to stand up for what the Holy Spirit says to stand up for. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, don't worry about the words you're going to say. I'll give you words to say before you even speak. We just got to have a heart. We got to seek him and surrender the body to him. To worship him in spirit and truth. And he will lead his church into days of victory. He will. We were asleep when abortion laws were passed in this nation. We were asleep when prayer was taken out of school. We were asleep when, when we're starting to see states legalize illegal drugs in this nation. We're, uh, we were still asleep when states one by one are changing the institution of marriage. You know, the IRS tells me, you can't say that because, you know, you're, you're going to lose your tax exempt status. Well, Mr. Uncle Sam, these are biblical principles that we're talking about. God set up marriage. God created life in the womb. And so, you can take whatever you want away, but you're not taking away my relationship with Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there are people listening right now. And there are people watching right now. And there's going to come a time in America when we're going to meet Jesus at that water well once again. And he's going to say, are you thirsty? And there's going to be many doubters around that water well. And I, I believe that time is now. There are people that are thirsty and hungry for the things of God. And who will give them water to drink? Who will pass along the things of God to them? While churches are busy talking about having their best day every day. I mean, it's not about having a best day. It's about seeing the day of the Lord come to pass. And so here we are. In the twinkle of an eye, this nation, the landscape of this nation will change. It will change in the twinkle of an eye. I love this nation. I love, thank God, I thank God Almighty that I was born in the United States of America. But, oh, are the sins of our fathers. Oh, how the sins are great of this nation. And kind of get a glimpse of the prophet Daniel when he cried out for his nation. And though he had committed no sin, Daniel included himself in the wrongdoings of the nation of Israel. And he cried out, Father, forgive us. Have mercy on us. Deliver us, Lord. Bring us back, Lord. And that's got to be the cry of the church today. When we got to go back to having that encounter with Jesus so that God can have his encounter with the rest of the world. Father, I pray. Oh, Lord God, I pray. We pray, Lord, as a church here today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit 
would distribute grace and mercy in this time of need, Lord. Oh, Father, I thank you for what you are doing. You are good and worthy to be praised. And we tell you, Lord, oh, Lord, have mercy on us.